explore us. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. Thanks for joining me as we kick off Season 3. It's good to be back, and I am more than ready to grab your hand and head into a whole new time and place. This is one that so many listeners have asked for, and one I can't wait to share. The Tudor England we so often see is full of nobles and royals, and we'll be spending time with them, to be sure. But all that cloth of gold and those courtly manners weren't what life was like for most people. So we're going to begin our season by honing in on what your average Tudor Ladies' Day looked like. I hope that what we find on our travels will surprise and delight you. Lucky for us, we have a special companion on this journey into Tudor times. Hello, I'm Ruth Goodman, and uh, I call myself a social historian. Ruth is the ultimate time traveler. She spent much of her working life engaged in living history, immersing herself in the way Tudors lived to uncover all the nitty-gritty details that the Exploress loves so well. Her book, How to Be a Tudor, is a must-read guide to the era, and her new book, The Domestic Revolution, is one I can't wait to get my hands on. Before we dive in, I have a quick announcement. Many of you know that my passion for history extends to writing historically-inspired fantasy novels, and, well, I've got some exciting news on that front to share soon. That news and the time commitment involved has inspired me to try something new with the Exploress. Instead of publishing big, long episodes, I'm breaking them up into smaller segments, releasing them chapter by chapter instead of all at once. That means you'll be getting a new episode from me every week instead of every two, which is awesome, and they'll be a little easier to absorb in one sitting. You can listen as soon as the episodes drop or wait for each series to be complete and binge them all at once. You'll get the same amount of content as before. It'll just be presented a little differently. Releasing episodes this way is going to help me weave the show around my other creative endeavors, which means I can keep bringing it to you on a regular basis. So, without further ado, slip on a linen shift, some sturdy hose, and grab a bucket of lye. Let's go traveling. So, where are we in history, exactly? Most of us know at least something about the Tudor period, but let's get some context for what kind of world we're stepping into. The last time we touched down on British soil on this podcast was in 60 CE, where a queen named Boudicca was fighting back against ancient Roman encroachment. Unfortunately for her, the Romans would hang around for quite a while longer, their culture mixing and melding with that of the local Celtic tribes. After 350 years or so, the story goes that Roman Emperor Honorius wrote to the British Romans, telling them he didn't have the resources to protect them anymore. From then on, they'd be looking to their own defenses. Not too long after, the Western Roman Empire started to collapse. This shift kicked off a period of invasion in Britain. Irish raiders stormed in from the west, the Picts from the north. But the most game-changing invaders were the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes, all Germanic peoples. Independent, still mostly Roman Britons, rebelled against them, but ultimately most of the region would fall under their control. In fact, they were the first to identify as English. Over the years, many of the smaller tribes coalesced into kingdoms, but Britain didn't become truly unified until the scary Vikings came. Starting in the 790s, the Vikings terrorized Britain's coastline. The Danes, a group of Vikings who came over in the 860s, didn't just pillage, they put down stumps and stayed. British kings and queens worked to fight off this threat, and sometimes they also fought with each other. It seems that no one could quite agree who should be the one to rule them all. Fast forward to 1066 and the Battle of Hastings, in which Anglo-Saxon King Harold II tried to defend his realm from the Norman invasion of William, Duke of Normandy, the guy we came to call William the Conqueror. William and his knights won the day, and they transformed England and helped impose Norman rule. Now, I want you to picture what historians call the Medieval Period, also known as the Middle Ages. 
Knights and their supposed code of chivalry. Thatched roof cottages, the bubonic plague, feudalism, the whole shebang. That's what precedes the Tudor period. It's also a time that features plenty of its own powerful kings and queens. William the Conqueror's youngest son, Henry I, brings peace and reform to Britain. But then Henry's nephew Stephen is crowned, despite the rival claim of Henry's daughter, Matilda. And things get pretty messy. Matilda's son, Henry II, eventually pulls things back in line. I mention him because he's the first of the so-called Angevin, or Plantagenet, kings. One's ability to trace their lineage back to this line will be extremely important a few years down the track. He's also worth mentioning because he ends up marrying the truly magnificent Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine. But we've gotta fly right past her for now. See you in a future season, Ellie. Let's skip forward to the 1450s, when a Plantagenet king named Henry VI is proving to be pretty incompetent at ruling. Rival aristocratic factions, each with their own army, see a chance to take the power for themselves. This kicks off what we now call the Wars of the Roses. This series of military campaigns and epic battles was fought between 1455 and 85, and they involved two royal families, the House of Lancaster and the House of York. They were both branches of the Plantagenet tree, but neither could agree on who should be in charge of things. For 30 years, the crown flies back and forth between them like an unwieldy shuttlecock, creating both unrest and drama galore. All those with clear claims to the throne were killed off. It was not a great time to be a Plantagenet descendant, unless you happened to be an ambitious and somewhat dubious one who'd spent most of your life staying out of the spotlight. This fellow, a guy by the name of Henry Tudor, is about to change English history. Indulge me for a moment as I tell you how he comes to the throne. It's through his mom, the hardcore Margaret Beaufort, that Henry gets his blood tie to the Lancastrian family, though it's more than a little bit murky. There are at least six guys with a clearer claim to the throne than Henry has. But ever since Yorkist King Edward IV defeated the Lancastrians in battle in 1471, Margaret has worked a tireless long game to give her son and the Lancastrians another chance at greatness. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Woodville, King Edward IV's queen, is suffering a horrid reversal of fortune. After her husband dies quite unexpectedly, her young son Edward is crowned, only to be kidnapped and taken prisoner by his uncle Richard III. Richard claims the throne, has all of Elizabeth's children deemed illegitimate, and forces them to run for sanctuary, afraid for their lives. It's a really dark time for this noble clan. But the women of the Wars of the Roses are cunning. Elizabeth Woodville and Margaret Beaufort happen to share the same doctor, and through him they pass notes and make a bold, secret pact. If Henry Tudor defeats Richard III in battle, Elizabeth Woodville will recruit all of her husband's old friends to support him. That is, if Henry swears to marry her daughter, Elizabeth of York, once he's king. This would be a great deal for Henry, as most people think she has more right to the English throne than anyone. She will lend him legitimacy, and he will bring Elizabeth's family back into the royal fold. Plan crafted. In 1485, Henry sneaks into England with a clutch of soldiers and defeats Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth. Henry marries Elizabeth of York, as promised, binding together these long-time rival families. You could say that it's these clever ladies who kick off the dynasty and bring a much longed for peace to the land. Finally, the people of England can come out of their defensive crouches. It's a country emerging from war and stepping gratefully into a whole new age, one that will last for 118 years. In many ways, Tudor England is still steeped in the medieval. The way most people live harkens back to earlier, middle-agey times. But this is also a time of profound growth and change. When Henry Tudor seized the throne, there were fewer than two million people in England and maybe another half a million in Wales. But by the time Elizabeth I dies, it's estimated that those numbers will double. London's population swells from 50,000 to some 200,000 in that time. 
As the population grows, so does England's importance as a cultural powerhouse. It's also important to remember that, even amidst all this medieval-y kingslaying, the Renaissance is happening over in Europe. The flowering of art, thought, and culture that will influence English trade, fashion, and thought in all sorts of ways. Sidebar, what do we mean exactly when we say England at this time? Wales will unite with England a year from now, in 1536, but is more or less controlled by England throughout the Tudor period. We're also talking about Ireland and Scotland, at least in terms of lifestyle and cultural overlap. But they, of course, have their own particularities. With all of that swirling in the back of your mind, let's touch down in summer, 1535. King Henry VIII is 44 years old and has been ruling England for 26 years. He's on his second and perhaps most scandalous wife, Anne Boleyn, but he's only a year away from ordering her execution. But let's not focus for now on kings and queens. Instead, let's explore a day in the life of your average lady in Tudor-era England. Next time, we'll rise and shine in our Tudor-era farmhouse, and Ruth Goodman will tell us all about how we're heating our houses, what we're stuffing our mattresses with, and the pros and cons of having a chimney. See you then! Thanks for listening. I want to thank some of my patrons, whose generous support really helps me keep the show going. My newest lady presidents, Anna, and the glorious and wonderful Jennifer M. My boss ladies, Bethany, Bronwyn, Elizabeth, Grace, Faye and Whimsy Soapworks, Hillary and Brian, Melissa, Michelle, Nuria, Rebecca, Tanya, Jessica, Sophie, and Julian. My newest adventuress, Helena, and Alexis V, Alexis M, Carlos, Iris, Jessica R, Jessica S, Karen, Amber, Kelly, Lizzie, Phil, Samantha, and Stephanie. My warrior queens, Lori and Avery, and my lady pharaohs, all three of whom are named Courtney. Love you, Courtney's. For just a few dollars a month, the patrons get prizes in the mail, early access to my episodes, interviews, polls, Q&As, as well as exclusive bonus episodes. To find out more, go to my website and click on Become a Patron. If you like the Explorers, tell a few friends about it or leave the show a review. It all really helps new listeners find it. For this episode's show notes, lots of images of the things we've just explored, suggested reading, and a list of Tudor rabbit holes to go down, go to my website, theexplorespodcast.com. The guitar music for this episode comes courtesy of John Sales, performed from surviving music straight out of the English Renaissance period. He graciously makes all of his excellent music freely available through his website, and you'll find a link to that in the show notes. Thank you, as always, to Mr. Explores, aka Paul Gablonski, for my theme music and logo. 